Alrighty. That was good. Matt and I were talking up here that when I said that, all the introverts were like, oh, no. <laughs> all the extroverts were like, oh, yeah. So it appears that we have more extroverts in the house. But maybe you guys just love each other. This would be fantastic. That's what we're called to do and be. Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, um, we believe that the glory of God and the greatness of his gospel really causes us to consistently reevaluate who we are as a church, to ensure that we are staying true to the word of God and to his gospel. And uh, thank you, Kit. And uh, to lean forward, uh, to, to ask God to use us in a powerful way, to be prayerful about that, but uh, to think creatively also about that. God, how would you advance us forward? And so that's what this is about. Um, so Matt and I are going to have a bit of a discussion back and forth, um, not only with each other, but with you, about a number of things that, that are very important to us with regard to who we are as a church, but also who we are as we lean forward to what God would have for us in the years ahead. So we're going to talk about it in those two dimensions. Uh, what's going on here and now that we have in store uh, as far as our plans go uh, for 2022, but then also as we look on the horizon, what is ahead of us. So very excited to talk about these things uh, with you, but I will say this hasn't been scripted. All right, so we know roughly what we're going to say, but yeah, we don't know exactly how this is going to go, but very excited. One of us knows more than the other. Very good. <laughs> very excited. <laughs> I gave him the notes this morning, no, not really, but I'm very excited about it. So, with regard to the here and now, thinking about Christ and his church, Matt, I want to just ask you the question, like, how would you define the church? Because we want to talk about, fundamentally, who we are as a New Testament body of faith. So, how would you define the church? Okay, I like that question a lot because I love the church, and I think it's been really popular in recent days to attack the church and to speak ill of the church, and of course there are plenty of churches that maybe have something to speak ill of, but um, I, I think of the church as family. I mean, we think of some of the metaphors of the church as the bride of Christ, um, you know, I mean, we think of ourselves as brothers and sisters, and, and we love our family, and so... If we're brothers and sisters in Christ, if we have the same father, if we have a common belief, then, then this is family, and, and uh, that's just a bond that can't be broken. I think, I mean, the New Testament, you know, if, if we're talking about the, the word church, right, we're talking about those who are called out, those who are called together. We're called out of the world, and we're called together as a body of believers. And so we're united by the fact that we have the same faith. We have the same hope in Jesus Christ. We, we have the same word of God. So we share all these things in, in common. And of course, the baptism of the spirit places us into the body of Christ, the universal church. And so, I mean, some of you have had this experience, many of you, of, of going you know, overseas or going some other place uh, and, and interacting with believers that you've never met before, that you have very little in common with, you know, as far as just lifestyle and those kind of things, and you have this instant bond, this instant connection and unity, because you know that you have the same faith and the same Lord and the same values, and, and, and the same things are vital and important to you. Um, so that, those are the kind of things that I think of when I think of the body of Christ, and then when we think of the local church, you know, local church like HBC, it is just believers gathering together for the purpose of you know following these New Testament commands, these New Testament mandates that are, are given to the church. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we gather for teaching and preaching and for fellowship and prayer and worship and service and encouragement of one another. I mean, this is a, a, a litany of things that the church is, is kind of to, to be about. And um, <clears throat> so those are, the, those are the things that we focus our, our time and attention on. And uh, I guess Dustin just said, like, as we've been talking about some of these things and we're looking forward to the next year, I mean, there are probably a, a huge list of things that we could say the church is about, but how do you, how would you just kind of summarize, um, you know, what are kind of the core things that we want to be about or, or how do we summarize that in a statement? Yeah, I would say to start with from Ephesians chapter one and really the theme of the whole Bible that the church is to be about the glory of God. That's our primary aim, if I could put it that way. 
our primary aim is to bring God glory. I love what Paul says to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 1, verses 11 through 14. It says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Who's the mover there? The mover there is God. He works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So, of course, Paul is talking to a first century audience there, but I think very much applicable to us today. We are not the first to believe, uh, but we indeed have been predestined of God. We have come to a place of repentant faith, led by God in that way for his glory. Right? You see that so clearly there. It is for his purposes, for his glory. So verse 13, in him, Paul says, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. What's the next phrase? To the praise of his glory. So multiple times in this passage, Paul comes to this line, to the praise of his glory. To the praise of his glory. It's all about God, his grace, his glory. And so our aim as a church, as a New Testament body of faith, is to collectively bring God glory. So that when people see us, though we are very much imperfect, together we might reflect that God has done something in us. God has made sweeping change in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. We have reason to be filled with joy and excitement in a world that is full of sorrow. Why? Because of the greatness of his gospel. Because of the fact that we have a hope in us for an eternity that many don't have. Right? So as people see that in us, individually and collectively, it brings God glory. Because it's all about him from start to finish. Amen? Amen. It's all about him. So I would start with, i gotta, I got to shorten this a little bit. I'm going to get through all this. I would start with the aim of bringing glory to God. But then secondly, I would move quickly to the overarching concept of making disciples. So if you want to turn over, you can to Colossians, just a couple pages. Colossians chapter 1. It's good to turn to these texts, to these texts, just to make sure we are reminded that these are our ideas. This is all coming from God, from His Word. Another thing that we are to be fundamentally about, in addition to bringing glory to God, is the presenting of mature disciples. Colossians chapter one, verses twenty-eight and twenty-nine. Paul says, "Him we proclaim." It's Christ, who he's lifted up in this first chapter. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. As we seek to fulfill the great commission of making disciples, this commission that Jesus set his early disciples on that is applicable to the church today, our goal here is to present mature disciples before God that we collectively, as we come together to feast on his word, as Paul references here, teaching everyone, warning everyone, presenting wisdom. Notice with me verse 29, by the way. For this he says, I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul is leaning forward, right? Dependent upon the power of Christ, upon the power of his spirit, but he is eager to work hard to present mature disciples, that these people might grow. And so as we think about overarching aims for the body of Christ here at Heritage, we desire to bring God glory and to present mature disciples. Now, this gets us to our core values. Uh, this is our vision statement that as a locally gathered New Testament body of Christ, we are purpose to fulfill our Lord's commission by seeking to advance the glory and gospel of Jesus Christ in Northeast Lincoln its surrounding communities and to the nations as God opens the doors of opportunity. There's a lot there that should be unpacked. I've unpacked a little bit of it. 
in the previous statement, but this leads to our core values that kind of help us get there. These are things that we've derived from Scripture that we believe help us stay on track to fulfill this mission of bringing God glory and making uh, disciples where we are. So let me just highlight for you some of these things again. First of all, centered on the gospel. One of the things that we understand is that the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the message of the whole Bible from start to finish. Okay? Uh, I like what one commentator wrote when he said it this way, the gospel is not the ABCs of the Christian faith, or just how you get in, the message that gets you in. The gospel is the A to Z. It is the entire message of the Bible. It all pivots on and centers on and points toward the good news of Jesus Christ. That you and I are all sinners from the very beginning, from our father, if you will, Adam, the first Adam. From that moment on, Romans chapter 5 makes it very clear that his sin passed to all of us, death by sin, so death spread to all men, for all have sinned. All of us are sinners. We've broken God's law. Because of that, we are separated from God. And our only hope to be reconciled to God, our creator, to have hope for forgiveness, is in Christ, not ourselves. Not ourselves. It's in Christ. And again, I'm getting too long. You might have to stop me. Never, uh, never get two preachers' microphones. I know. <laughs> Centered on the gospel. So, the themes of the gospel, the redemptive themes of the gospel, and the grace of God, this must permeate everything we do. Moreover, it's the message of the gospel that must be sort of emphasized in the main aha of every text that we preach. And this protects us from legalism. It protects us from license. It causes us to stay faithful to what God intended for his people in all times and places to hear. Centered on the gospel, intentional in community. We live in a world that is progressively moving towards isolation. And that, that, was, that was significantly happening pre-COVID. And COVID has kind of sped that up a bit. We must be intentional, brothers and sisters. To get together, to be together, to experience life on life. This is the way the New Testament reads. No one is saved in isolation. We are saved into a family, into a community, whereby we rub shoulders with each other and sharpen one another. We edify and build one another up. There are some 61, 61 one another commands in the New Testament. Whereby God is saying, this is what I'm asking you to do for one another. To engage in with one another. You can't do that just as an independent, isolated Christian. All right? So we must be intentional. One of the ways we do that, we'll talk about it more in a moment, is through small groups. I'll, I'll give it back to you in a second. All right. I should split this up. Um, sound in worship. One of the things that's so important for us here at Heritage Bible is that the Bible would inform everything we do. So we look to the Word of God as the grid by which we determine the songs we sing. Um, also, we look to the Word of God each Sunday to hear from God. We don't create sermons, right, and then look for texts to prove them. We just go to the Word of God and say, God, what have you said? And we try to faithfully understand that and present that to you so that you can come week after week and just hear from God. And moreover, we invite questions about that. Okay, we are not the ultimate authority here. God is the ultimate authority, and his word is ultimate in authority. So if you hear Matt or I or anyone else preaching something, that you go like, I don't think that's in the Bible. I don't think that's quite accurate. We invite questions. We would love for you to come to the office and say, like, what did you mean by that? Because ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, Every week as we study hard, to present God's word to you. We're just trying to understand God's word and faithfully present it. So sound and worship, it means sturdy, based on the word of God. <laughs> Committed to mission. The church doesn't exist just for itself. Okay, The church is to be on the move. All right, Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this communicates this powerful sentiment that Jesus Christ will continue to build his church as the gospel goes forward. You and I must be looking to reach out 
right? And this happens in a particular way. We'll talk about that a little bit more later, but we must be intentional to think that way. It's not just us and our holy huddle. Um, we must come together to worship and be built up and edified and strengthened and impassioned by God, who he is, his gospel. But then that should boil out of us, bubble over out of us into the community and abroad. Committed to mission. And then, and then lastly, surrounded by grace. This sort of takes us back to the gospel. And this understanding that we must recognize that we're all sinners. And if we're honest about that, what will we understand? We will understand that if we actually are intentional to be together in community, it's not going to be perfect here. My friends, it's not going to be perfect here. People are going to disappoint you. People are going to hurt you. It's going to be hard. And so we believe that the gospel calls us to try to lean in and work things out and ask questions instead of making assumptions so that the grace of God will be permeated in this place. All right? That requires effort. It requires humility. It requires conversation. And we hope that God's grace will tether us together for his glory. So that's a little bit about who we are. Our primary aim is to bring God glory, to make disciples. And these things, centered on the gospel, intentional in community, sound in worship, committed to mission, and surrounded by grace, we believe help us get there, help drive us out there. So... Right now, I just want to take an opportunity uh, to highlight some of our leaders, okay? Some of you might be a little bit newer and not know exactly who the elders are, who the deacons are, who our staff is. So let me just highlight them for you. And then we just want to talk about how the church is the people. It's not a building. It's not an organization. It's not a denomination. The church is the people. So these are our deacons. Man, these guys are... Fantastic. Let's give them a round of applause for the glory of God. <laughs> These guys all serve um, most of the time behind the scenes for no credit, but constantly serving Christ and his people here. And undoubtedly you've encountered these guys, but I want to encourage you to know who they are and uh, to seek them out just to say thanks for all the things that they do around here to and they're, they're handsome too maybe handsome possibly the most handsome deacon lord in Lincoln. So. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah it was voted on journal star reporting that's it <laughs> this is our staff uh, team and there is definitely a rose amidst the thorns right <laughs> um and you and i didn't make the cut no <laughs> wanted to keep the handsome thing <laughs> We're not on the starting five, uh, apparently, <laughs> starting four, but this is our staff team. I'm so thankful for the team that God has established here and for the unity that we are experiencing right now. And uh, it's just a, a wonderful camaraderie. And we are, are seeking to work hard each week to uh, shepherd you well, though we fall short, undoubtedly. Uh, this is our team, and we would invite their questions, comments, um, any way in which we could serve you more effectively. We'd love to know that. And then also our elder team. So thankful for these brothers uh, who serve, uh, again, most of the time behind the scenes, but just to seek to um, hold us accountable to be faithful to the Word of God, discerning difficult theological issues, difficult uh, situations that arise. I'm so thankful for this council of elders, this group of wisdom that God's provided uh, to help lead his church here. So. Those are some of the guys that help uh, lead this body. But ultimately, we want to make it very clear that the ministry doesn't just happen um, from the leaders down. The ministry is really happening all the time because the church is the people. Mark. My bad. Oh. Apologies. My apologies. Um, yeah, and this this dovetails right into what Mark just said. So thankful for the body of Christ and the people of God that make up this community of faith. And it is indeed a community. It is a community of faith whereby people are engaging with one another. And so in 
defining the church, invariably you get to that aspect of the community. It's the body of Christ made up of many members that are all working together. And so as we think about the community, man, I want to just ask you, why is Christian fellowship, friendship, and life-on-life -life community so important to the church? I think the idea that the idea that we could um, get what we need from church on our phone, you know, or we could just stay home in our pajamas like we've kind of been joking about when, when someone's been sick, um, would be to tell God your, your word is out of date, right? Your word hasn't kept up with, with the times. But the reality is that we know that we have a very specific command not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? So that's just like point one, and we can pretty much stop there. But if we go beyond that to some of the things that you already mentioned, like the one another's, and we see that scripture tells us to love one another and pray for one another and encourage one another and, and bear one another's burdens and, and all these kind of things. How can we do that if we don't gather? If we don't ever see each other. And so you just don't have the concept in the New Testament of a Lone Ranger Christian. You know, I'm just going to kind of do this on my own. and I don't really need community or fellowship or help from, from anyone else. And um, we just believe in a church that is passionate about helping each other to contend earnestly for the faith. That's what Jude tells us, right? Contend earnestly for the faith. Well, I, I want people to come alongside and, and, and put an arm around me and, and go along with me. And I want to be able to do that to others. And whatever stage of growth you're in, there's someone that you can reach a hand to and, and bring them along and take them with you. And God has designed us to do that. So I, I believe that at the moment of salvation, every single believer is supernaturally gifted with an ability that is for others, that is for the church. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not in community, if we're not consistent to, to meet together and to be with one another and to seek each other out, then we're not able to use the gift that God has given us. And it's basically like saying, uh, hey, thanks for the gift, God. Right? I'm just going to put it on this shelf up here you know, with the ugly sweater that I got or whatever, and, and I'm not going to use a gift that God has given me. Yeah. And the church as a whole, it's the same thing with the church as a whole. God's word says over and over and over that the church, that other believers, that gathering together is a source of blessing from God. And so it would be incredibly arrogant of us to say, ah, I don't need any more blessings from God. I don't want any blessings, you know, that, that, that come from God. No, we're desperate for God's blessing. We're desperate for God's help in our life. Well, that comes through the church. And again, like you said, the church is, the church is fallen. The church is sinful. We make mistakes. And I think, you know, in some cases, um, the the lack of involvement can come from the fact that maybe we have a, a, a history, right? We have a past of having been, you know, hurt in the church or hurt by the church. But we have to go back to the word and go back to what God's word says about it. And, and we have to believe what God says about the church and just be willing to invest our, our time and attention there. So with regard to community, one of the big ways in which we try to encourage people to engage in it is through small groups. And uh, you're kind of putting your shoulder into that. Uh, why are you so pumped about leading that ministry? Yeah, I mean, all, all the reasons I just articulated, it's, it's take that into small groups on the, on, the, on the smaller level, right? So, I mean, it's easy, you know, sometimes we, we all do this maybe from week to week. It's easy to kind of come in, hear a sermon, leave, right? And you can have minimal interaction if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, but in small groups, we're talking about life on life. We're talking about coming alongside and fellowshipping with one another on a more personal level. level. And so you have opportunity to build relationships that will help you to walk with Christ more faithfully. And you have the opportunity to build in to others in, in the same way. And um, one of the things that I love about the way our small groups operate is that they dig deeper into the biblical text that we've already talked about on Sunday morning. So we're going to say, okay, let's take that passage and let's start asking questions about it. Let's start making application. Let's put some shoe leather on it so we can you know, walk this out during the week. Um, you know, we, we heard this great sermon, and now we kind of ask the question, so what? Like, what difference does that make in my life? What difference does that make in my week or my marriage or my family? And those are the things we're able to flush out together in, in small groups. So, and, and, and I, I'll say, uh, I, I, want, I, I hope everyone will take the opportunity this morning to just learn more about small group, groups. Hopefully you got a little handout on the way in. If you didn't, stop by the foyer on the way out and grab one. It just kind of tells you a little bit about why small groups are so important to us. And it also gives you the information that you need to join uh, up in a small group, okay? 
Um, I had suggested we, we put the uh, names and faces of the people who are not in a small group right now on the screen, but that was <laughs> elders, uh, elders nixed that. No, this is not, the, the goal is not like guilt trip anybody into small groups, you know, we're not like trying to drag you there kicking and screaming, but we, we do passionately desire for everyone to be in a small group because we just believe in the, the blessing and the benefit of it. Um, and, and so what you have there is a list of all the different small groups. Uh, and specifically, you have groups that are open to, to having new members. We have a few groups that are full, just their, their space is full. But we also are starting three new small groups that uh, are completely empty, and the leaders will be really sad if they show up on their first Sunday next week, and they are the only ones there. My children will be really sad, because I will make them listen to me talk about God's Word if nobody else shows up at our small group. So, listen, find out. Yeah, you have enough. Yeah, yeah we, do have, we do have our own small group. <laughs> <laughs> find a find a group that works for you. Uh, you're not married. Once you go to a group one time, you can go to a group and check it out. Maybe check another one out. Find the time, the place, the, the, the people that work best for you, and just find a place to get plugged in and, and be consistent. Um, as soon as we're done here this morning, we're going to have representatives from every small group that we have back in the foyer at uh, the, the welcome table back there. And we also have sign-up sheets. So you can go and put your name and information down and uh, they can contact you and let you know more about you know, where and when they meet and, and, and kind of try to, to pull you into a group. Uh, so I just really encourage you to pursue that. Yeah, in the, in the back. Fantastic. Thank you, brother. Yeah, let me just add my encouragement there. Encourage you to get involved and press into this life-giving community. Oh, one other thing I want to mention is uh, just in relation to small groups, and this is kind of for our leaders that I'm, I'm excited and passionate about in the next few months being able to grab all of our small group leaders and bring us together as, as much as we can and do some training. Uh, some of you are familiar with uh, the, the Trellis and the Vine, the book Trellis and the Vine. Uh, Colin Marshall, who's one of the authors of that, also has a, a book called uh, Growth Groups, and it's just kind of uh, talks about leading church small groups and, and importance of it and how we can lead better and so just want to do some of that not that we're not doing things well but just always to kind of be reminded of why we gather and, and what we're doing um, in, in some of those areas so um, Dustin I guess maybe the transition is from from small groups to, to big group what we all in youth ministry always call big church right <laughs> uh, if we think about you know what we're doing as far as gathering gathering together you know large groups Sunday mornings um, just talk to me a little bit about kind of the rhythm of that and what that looks like for us. Yeah, I mentioned this earlier with regard to sound and worship, but the Bible, the scriptures, inform everything we do on a Sunday morning. And uh, we seek to read from it, um, pray from it, um, sing it, and then teach it. And we derive this from uh, an understanding of what the Bible is, first of all that the Bible is the Word of God. And so when we gather together, we want to hear from Him. We don't want to just hear our own ideas, uh, cultural thoughts. We want to hear from God. And it's really quite a staggering thing that you and I get to gather and listen to the divine God, our Creator God. And so that's what we seek to do, um, generally as we understand the Scripture, but also as we understand the explicit commands. So, one of the obligatory places that we could go to is 2 Timothy chapter 3. And you could look at it if you'd like, but I'm just going to read a few verses from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and following into chapter 4. But this is Paul coaching his protege, Timothy, as a pastor, reminding him of the importance of the Scripture. Verse 16, it says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That we talk about the body of Christ gathering and edifying and building one another up. How does that fundamentally happen? It fundamentally happens when the Spirit of God is at work in their life using the Word of God, which does what? It equips, it trains, it reproves, it corrects. It's the Word of God that prepares us to serve one another and to be a light for the gospel in our community. And so, it's not surprising that the very next phrase is this. Paul says to Timothy, preach it. So preach it. 
chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, which, by the way, can't unpack all, unpack all of this, but is a solemn thing, a solemn thing that Paul is adding to this admonition for Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. He goes on to talk about the fact that there will be a time, and we are definitely here now, when people won't want to hear it. They won't want to hear what God has to say unfiltered. Rather, they'd like to hear what the culture has to say. right? Or perhaps a version of the word of God that suits their own passions. But Paul says, don't do that. Don't go that route. Stay true and faithful to the word of God. And so as we think about sound and worship and what we seek to do as we corporately gather week after week, it's really all centered on the word of God. Amen. All right, so if people uh, haven't caught our branding already this morning with their uh, their journals and their t-shirts and, and such, just talk a little bit about what we're going to teach in the coming year and why. Yeah, very excited to be going through the Gospel of John. And so we're going to uh, go through the Gospel of John, just the first 12 chapters. Uh, theologians often break down the Gospel of John in, in two neat halves. There's a prologue and an epilogue, but then two neat halves, 1 to 12, called the Book of Signs, and then 13 to 21, the Book of Glory, or the passion um, elements of the Gospel. And so John is unique in that way. What we are going to tackle uh, this year it is the first 12 chapters. And John gives to us a beautiful summary of what that is really all about. And so I would invite you actually to turn your Bibles right now to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. One of the reasons that we decided to teach John 1 to 12 this year. It had to do with the fact that last year we taught through the book of 1 John. So same author. But we were just kind of blown away by how much the Apostle John had to say in the book of 1 John about who Jesus Christ is. This reality of the hypostatic union of Christ as fully God and fully man. Simultaneously. 100% God, 100% man. And so you guys heard me say that ad nauseum uh, last year, and I hope that it's stuck in your brain a little bit, right? That Jesus is fully God and fully man. And so as we thought about that, and we're in fact kind of surprised by how much that was emphasized in the letter 1 John, we thought, how cool would it be to come back this year and just see Jesus in action? So we've heard it sort of be a definition. But... We need to see it, okay, in narrative, to see Jesus reflected for us in the Gospel of John as fully God and fully man. And what that communicates is profound for his people. And so that's a little bit of background. It's not the only reason we chose this, but one of the reasons why we felt like the Spirit of God was leading us this direction. So if you're in John chapter 20, uh, go with me to verse 30. John chapter 20 and verse 30. Here the Apostle John gives a beautiful summary. And this wouldn't surprise you if you went through 1 John. He does, he does the same thing in 1 John. But in John here, the Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 30, he gives to us this summary statement that says this. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. What a statement. What a statement in John's testament of why he wrote. Many other signs, but he's carefully chosen these particular signs so that you and I would see these signs were an opportunity for people to see, to have a, a witness of glory, have a witness of who Jesus Christ really was and 
who he really is, and then ultimately for the purpose of faith. Okay, so as John writes this gospel, there, there is a uh, very much an, uh, an apologetic element to it. He's seeking to prove something to you. Like if you're on the fence about who Jesus is, if you're on the fence about the whole faith, you're welcome here to study this with you. And what John is saying is, if you give your heart to this and your mind to this to study this, I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. He really was and he really is the Messiah. He really is the Son of God. But it's not just for the unbeliever. It's also for the believer that you and I would see anew and afresh, see who Jesus was and is, that we might see and believe. So that's kind of the slogan, the tagline uh, for this year as we walk through the first 12 chapters of the Gospel of John, that we might see Jesus for who he is week after week. So having looked just briefly at this summary statement, see it in its context. Would you guys allow your eyes to go back in chapter 20 to verse 24? Think about it this moment. Put yourself in the room. John chapter 20, verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So Jesus had already appeared to his disciples, but Thomas wasn't there. And remember, these dudes were, were discouraged. They were also confused. They didn't quite understand it all yet. Thomas wasn't with them. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Can you imagine that moment? They're just bouncing off the walls. Still not quite sure what's going on, but totally pumped that they've seen Jesus. He's alive. He's not dead. He's alive. And what does Thomas say? But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark, excuse me, into his side, Oh, man, I just botched that. Let me, let me read that again. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Listen to that from Thomas. I mean, that's pretty despairing, isn't it? I think we find some encouragement here. All right? Undoubtedly, Thomas is a true follower of Jesus. Undoubtedly. But right now he is totally confused and discouraged. In fact, you might say he is despairing. I will never believe unless I see it with my own eyes, unless I put my finger in his hands and in his side, I will never believe. Then watch Jesus. He's so gracious, isn't he? So gracious to come to us in our doubt, in our confusion. Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And of course, Jesus knew that. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, which, by the way, pretty cool. Would you agree? The doors are locked, it's closed, and suddenly he's just there. Pretty remarkable. And then he said, peace be with you. He's not angry. He comes to Thomas with tremendous grace, the grace of Christ. Verse 27, said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. And in fact, he quotes Thomas, communicating, I heard exactly what you said. <laughs> So what does he go on to say? Do not disbelieve, but believe, believe. So Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. What a statement. Can you imagine being in that room? The way I imagine it, Thomas drops to his knees. He's overwhelmed. It's starting to make sense. My Lord and my God. But Jesus has encouraging words, not only for Thomas, but for us as well. He said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen. You and I have not seen a physical Jesus. 
We have not had the privilege of putting our hands in Jesus' side to say, now that I've seen physically, I will believe. Jesus says, blessed are those. It's kind of a different beatitude, an additional beatitude. Blessed are those who, though they have not seen physically, they have seen spiritually, and they believe. Then John writes, I've given you these signs. There were so many more, so many more. In fact, the last verse of this record in chapter 21, he says, like, all the books of the world cannot contain what Jesus did, but I've specifically chosen these so that you might see, that we might, Lord willing, week after week, have eyes like Thomas as we gather together inside a world that is fraught with confusion and pain and difficulty. We might gather together and see week after week who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and believe. Maybe some for the first time. But all of us weekly believe, renew our faith and trust in who he is. My friends, he's alive today. Amen. 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 He's alive today. And John wants to introduce us to him every week. So that's what we're going to, we're going to study as we gather here corporately. So Matt's already referenced these, but we have these journals again uh, that were a blessing last year. And basically what they are is an opportunity for you if you are uncomfortable writing in your own Bible or if you just don't have enough room to keep track of the text and, and take notes, this might help you to interact with the text directly, circle stuff, highlight stuff, but then make your own notes about it. So we wanted to offer those uh, to you free. They're on the back uh, table and also t-shirts that will help us have a sense of community around this subject that as we see and believe week after week, hopefully God's going to shine the light of Jesus in us and through us to a watching world. We'll tease that out more as the series continues, but I'm very excited to study John 1 to 12 with you guys this year. Good. I'm excited. And uh, all of the elders have gold stars, so if you show your notes to them, they... No, I mean that. I'll give you a gold star on your note page. For a week. If you get 10 gold stars... Get another t-shirt. There you go. I didn't know where I was going with that. So thank you. No, I'm, I'm so excited to be in the Gospel of John. I, I kind of look at the Gospel of John as uh, like uh, superhero Jesus. I mean, this is the, like the idea of signs. It's just miracle after miracle after miracle and, and, and just falling in love with the person of Christ. But also seeing the work of Christ, and that's what's going to strengthen our faith throughout the years. Is, you know, these things that we desperately wish we could have been eyewitnesses of, uh, we, we can't see these things, but we have John. Right? And John was an eyewitness. John was there. And he saw this. And that's the, the beginning of 1 John right? that we just hammered home, is that John experienced these things firsthand. And so now we go to his gospel, and we get that, we get that sense. And uh, so I think you're all going to love it. Um, speaking of time in the, in the Word, and, and even speaking of the gospel of John, talk a little bit about the Bible conference that's coming up and, yeah. uh, and what we're doing there. Yeah, so very excited to... Uh, study John even together with other churches locally. This will be at Faith Bible Church. Several churches coming together to have a two-day conference. This will be February 25th and 26th. It's a Friday night and Saturday. And we are going to walk through, verse by verse, the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. And it's an epic chapter um, that really does take a couple of days and, and perhaps many more uh, to digest. But very excited about that. We have as guest speakers coming in, we have Jared Wilson from Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He's a fantastic uh, preacher and has authored uh, many books that have been a blessing to the larger evangelical church. He will be with us on Friday night. And then also a friend of ours, Danny Brooks. He's a pastor in Utah. He will be with us also Friday and Sunday. Uh, that weekend and so very excited to have those guys with us along with a contingent of our of our local uh, pastors but we will be going through john 17. it's a beautiful opportunity by the way as a teaser a divine eavesdrop it's perhaps the only opportunity that we have in the scripture just to see jesus and the father the son and the father talking so it's just jesus conversing with his father throughout the, that entire chapter. And that's pretty epic if you think about it. Pretty epic moment to peek into the Trinity. 
So we're going to talk about that February 25th and 26th. Make plans. Hopefully you will make plans to be there. By the way, you can sign up even now, right? <coughs> it's, right. it's live. It's Not right now, it's like it's going live this week as far as the sign up. Uh, but it's a great time. Would encourage you to make time for it. Yeah, these, these are the kind of opportunities to, to just kind of jumpstart your year and your growth and to dig deep into God's Word and to hear from multiple speakers. I mean, it's just incredible. So do not pass up this opportunity. Uh, make sure your family is, is there and uh, sign up early and often. Yeah. Um, another thing I think is just what else is in store for us. And we talk about yeah. just different ministry opportunities, teaching opportunities, opportunities to be, to be fed or to serve. Uh, so what else do we have in the, in the coming year? In light of that high priestly prayer and in light of who Jesus is as our great high priest, um, Matt and I have agreed to do a monthly message, just a, an additional message that will be sent to you guys via video on the subject of prayer. So uh, 12 times over this next year, we will send a message to the body on the subject of prayer. And very excited to think about that additionally uh, to our study in the Gospel of John, just to think about the subject of prayer, the privilege of prayer, the opportunity that you and I have to be with our Father in communion, in communion and also seeking His activity in our lives. Uh, so that's just a little something that we're excited to do as well. I'll just jump in and say one, one of the things that I'm so passionate about in prayer that I, that I think can revolutionize our prayer life is the addition of just adoration or making sure that you have a, a worship component to your prayer life. So it's not just, you know, okay, dear Lord, here's the list of needs that I have for you today, right? But then we're actually worshiping in prayer. And that's going to fit so beautifully with what we're doing in John. Because as we see who Christ is, we're just going to be compelled to worship. And so we add that component to what we're learning about prayer, and that just has the opportunity to really, really help us to grow in that area. What, um, so we're, we talk, we're talking a lot about in the body, small groups, being here on Sundays, you know, being in the Word together. But as we look outside of the church, right, we gather to worship and we scatter to evangelize, right? We scatter to, to take the gospel hopefully to our community and to the world. And so what does that look like in the coming year and, and how are we making that happen? Yeah, so we have to be intentional that way. It's easy for us just to gather and get comfortable with just coming together and forget about the fact that Jesus has called us to reach out, right? To reach across, um, to understand that we live in a world that needs the light of Christ. Uh, you'll see that in the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Uh, it's so important that we are senders of that light, reflectors of the light. We are not the light, <laughs> as John the Baptist made clear. He was not the light. But we are called to reflect the light of Christ to other people. And so one of the things that's, that's very important to us as we think about the mission is to understand how the New Testament fleshes that out with regard to how it is to work that we believe that everywhere believers are gathered locally as a church, that their primary mission should be right there. Our primary mission is our neighborhood, okay? As we gather corporately, it's the people of this community, the people of Havelock. As we scatter, it's the people within your sphere of influence. This is primary mission, right? So we need to understand that we are all missionaries. <clears throat> Okay? When we hear the language of missions, we shouldn't just like reach for a checkbook and think about overseas. In reality, we should reach for our shoes. Right? How can God use me to carry the gospel to my neighbors, to my co-workers, to my friends at school, to my family members? But then you and I together, corporately, how can we advance the glory and gospel of Jesus Christ in this community? where our church is, to make a dent in the community of Havelock. Something we talked about from day one here is that we have to be careful not to just say, like, we are a Heritage Bible Church here for Lincoln, Nebraska. It's too broad. It's too big. You can't get your hands around that. Ultimately, we are here for the community of Havelock. Yes, for broader Lincoln. And we hope to have broader impact. But in shrinking that, we are going, we actually can make a dent here. We can make an impact here. And so what we believe is that God has ordained for it to work in this way in concentric circles, that as God's people are passionate about him and about his gospel and spreading it where they are, that that is going to move out, right? And so we must be faithful here 
in order to be faithful, for example, overseas. And so that is how we think about missions. And uh, so here is a reflection of that. Everywhere you see like the yellow color, these are local in nature. Ministering the gospel not only here in Havelock, but here in the city of Lincoln through particular organizations and people who are passionate to reach out, sometimes to the nations who God has brought here. And so some of those are local. The black ones are ministries that are not here. They are overseas. So we have in the previous slide, uh, well, with the exception of C, uh, that, that one's local as well, but Tim Cassie and Frontline Missions, the Andersons with the Navigators down in Kansas, uh, Aaron and Rebecca Nathaniel in Israel through Middle East Ministries, the Leachans in Laos, Dave Camo and his family planting a church in Boston. By the way, that church, Emmanuel Church, they will be launching this spring. And so very excited about that. I've had a lot of communication with Dave of late. But uh, these are some of the missions that we are involved in uh, currently. And so we're, we're sending, praise the Lord, we're sending um, uh, north of $50,000 a year to the advance of the gospel away from Heritage Bible Church. And I'm very excited about what God is doing uh, in that way. Yeah, so, a lot, I mean, a lot happening and a, a lot that we just want, we, we just covet your prayers for. And so many things that we're not even touching on, Sunday school classes and men's and women's ministries and, and, and Bible studies. Um, but also looking not only with what's happening now, but, but going forward into the future, touch on some of the things that we've, that we've already maybe talked to the people about that, that we have plans for and what that's going to look like. Very good. And, and by the way, just a note on that, I don't know we need to, we need to hustle here. But I'm so thankful for our youth ministry, our youth group, and Lighthouse Kids. I know in my own family, we've had great opportunities to invite our neighbors to these ministries. And so we've, we've been able to see God do work in our own kids and in our own church, but also mission work through ministries like that. So excited about that. Very thankful. Well, as we peek into the future, there are two things that I want to just highlight again for you uh, briefly. We had hoped to have a particular announcement about um, our coffee shop project in Havelock, which we've hoped and prayed for quite a while now to have a consistent presence um, in the community of Havelock, ultimately to build relationships for the advance of the gospel there. I don't have specific details that I can share with you. We're, we're close, we believe, to having more of those details to share, but wanted to remind you that we are very much leaning forward with this project and very excited about what God is doing with regard to this. So as a reminder, this is the logo uh, for the coffee shop and the 1893 piece is the date in which the, it was the year that Havelock was founded as a township. And we're very excited about the opportunity that we have as a church to potentially have a space in our community whereby we can meet people, be a blessing to our community, but also build relationships for the advance of the gospel. So that's the logo. This is what it would potentially look like as we get it, get it built out and uh, very excited about that and just want to encourage you to pray pray for what god would do with and through this project i'm just excited about free coffee for all church members that's <laughs> <laughs> a good idea you had <laughs> i'm gonna let mark answer that question <laughs> We're excited to talk, uh, secondly, just for a minute here about planting a new church. This has been a vision from the beginning of Heritage Bible, and I don't have time to unpack the theology behind this, but I'm very excited to see a new church planted um, in 2023. And so I uh, wanted to announce uh, to you uh, this morning that we feel like the clock has started, that we have 18 months, that we are planning, making arrangements to launch a new church in September of 2023. And uh, Matt and Corey McGrew, their presence uh, with us is a big part of the reason why we can start that clock. And uh, feel very excited about what God is going to do in multiplying this congregation to start a new one in another needy area where we can make a, a dent in another needy area of the city or around the city for the glory of God in the advance of his gospel. I don't know if there's anything you want to say about that, but. So much. 
<laughs> but not this morning. Um, no, mostly, mostly just pray. I mean, pray. It's a lot of details to work out, a lot of things to, to figure out. You know, I think what we know at this point is that we're passionate for Lincoln, and uh, we just desire the, the Word of God to be taught and available in, in every area. Lincoln is growing like crazy. Uh, I am now, I have become my father because my father used to drive me around Lincoln and say, this used to be nothing but corn over here. You know? <laughs> None of this was here when I was growing up. And now that's what I do with my kids. And they're like, yeah, dad, we know this used to be corn. Like, whatever, we don't care. And, uh, but, you know, as we've moved back, I mean, we've just been, you know, as, as you all have been just struck by how the city is expanding. I mean, a new high school going north, a new high school coming up south. And uh, we just believe that there is opportunity and, uh, and communities that are going to need a gospel presence. So, uh, and we hope that there will be people that go with us so that it won't just be two rows of Wagru children <laughs> <laughs> during my sermon. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, so we, we don't know exactly where or all the who, but very excited to uh, get this clock started and to invite you guys to pray that God would blow his spirit wind into this. So, yeah, so that's a lot that we've shared this morning about who we are as a church and where we believe God is leading us. And so we wanted to wrap all of this in prayer. And so I'm going to read again this passage from Ephesians chapter 3 and invite uh, Pastor Nick Ordina to come up and just pray over this vision uh, with us as a church family. Now to him who is able, this is all by and for him. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We're praying that God would blow us away by his grace this year. That's it. You thought you were going home. <laughs> We'd just like to thank Matt and Dustin for the introduction. <laughs> so everybody just get comfortable. Uh, no, don't, please don't check out. Um, we, we will keep this short, but it's very important. And I feel a little bad for squeezing it in at the end, but, but do not check out on this. Uh, something that's been on the heart of the elders for, for a long time. And, and Kent and I will do our best just to, to give you the thoughts on this, and, and we're going to have a follow-up uh, service on it, but if you would stay tuned, we'd appreciate it. So I'll let you start. So we're going to share some thoughts on the concept of sabbatical. Um, in light of the elder team supporting and encouraging Dustin to take a sabbatical for several months later this spring, sabbatical is a time when typical work activity is suspended for the purpose of attending to one's soul. The concept is rooted in the biblical concept of Sabbath, which God modeled in Genesis 2 and commanded in Exodus 20. And then in Leviticus 25, the Lord says that after the sixth year, the people were not supposed to sow the fields or harvest a crop. The land was allowed to rest, and therefore, so were the people. So we might think of this in terms of being a once every seven year rest, reflection, and renewal time away. And Dustin has been faithfully leading and shepherding here for 12 years. Jesus himself also modeled and invited his disciples into rhythms of both work and spiritual rest in Luke 5 and Mark 6. Pastoral ministry is hard, and it's taxing in many unique ways, and we could, we could talk about that a bunch. Um, uh, pastors step in consistently uh, week after week into, uh, into the pain of others, uh, engaging in difficult conversations and situations. Uh, and we all know how much it means for somebody to step in and just come alongside and speak truth. Um, but that's taxing, so much so that a small number of pastors who begin pastoral ministry actually finish in pastoral ministry. The elders here at Heritage desire and value long-term healthy ministry as a body that can only happen if it's modeled by our leaders. Yes, we want to be all in and run the race hard, but we also must step away to experience rest and renewal. Keeping in mind marathon, not sprint. Standing in Christ's righteousness, not ours. Leaning in to the Spirit's power, not ours. So what's that look like? It's a planned period of time that the pastor is granted a leave away from his normal responsibilities in order to, to spend an extended period of time in rest, renewal, and refreshment. It means pulling back from the fray and demands of ministry. Normal contact discussing ministry matters is deferred. 
relational connections limited mainly to immediate family, and encourage retreating with family to a different geographic region for a part of the time. A sabbatical is a time for the pastor to shift gears in order to rest, disengage, study, reflect, or travel in order to return to the ministry renewed and refreshed in body, soul, and mind. This is not a vacation, nor is it continuing education. He's not expected to accomplish anything. Sabbatical provides the pastor an opportunity to reflect on his call to ministry, his relationship with God, his wife and family, and with the church that he is shepherding. It is expected to benefit the pastor, his wife and family, and the congregation. First Timothy 4.16 says that, uh, Paul speaking to Timothy, it says, keep a close watch on yourself and on teaching. Um, and, and in the Amplified Version, it actually says, pay a close attention to yourself, <coughs> concentrate on personal development. And as Ken just said, sabbatical is not a break or vacation. It's actually an integral part of the, the calling of a pastor and, and it's part of the job. And, and we want to make sure everybody understands that, that that's truly what it is. Um, I went out to eat last night with my daughter and, and watched the waitress who was responsible for filling up all the glasses of water. And I, I almost likened it like this, that that was her job is to continually make sure everybody else's glass was full until her pitcher runs out of water. And then she needs to go back and get more water. And I'll just tell you that our pastor his job, and Dustin has been doing this for, for more than 12 years, filling up our glasses with, with the gospel, with God's word, with himself. As you know, his passion is all about people and he has a heart for. And, and this is hard for him. We have started this discussion three, almost three and a half, four years ago. And, and he can say, yeah, well, next year, next year, next year. And we finally just said, we figured it out. You can't give him the option. So we said, yeah. You're, you're done now, you're moving on. Uh, taking your sabbatical, this is part of your job description. And, and so hopefully you can all see the need for that. Um, again, and, and this isn't him bringing this up. This isn't him complaining about something. This isn't him asking for a break. This is us saying this is part of the development of our pastor and part of our pastoral job. And so we just wanted you to understand that. We're gonna develop that and the details a little more but it's coming up this spring. It'll be a lengthy period of time, and we wanted you to have a little bit of an understanding of that. Uh, we're actually gonna have John do a message uh, further on the importance of rest in ministry, the importance of, of taking back and, and, and reconnecting, and then being able to pour out again. And so I hope you understand it in that concept. That's our intent. Uh, we want our pastor to be able to fill up his picture uh, we want him to be available for us, and, and we think that's important. And so we just wanted to lay that out for you. Um, as you might imagine, for an attorney, there's a lot more here. If you want, you know, I bill by the hour, so I got a lot of yellow pages. <laughs> we can go through this, um, but no time is getting away. But I want you to pray for him and his family as this is coming up. Because, again, not easy, uh, and, and, and not easy even for us to all conceptually think about it, but I hope you realize the importance of it. So we wanted to lay that out for you guys before we left here today. Make sure you knew that was part of the vision for this year. And we want to take care of our pastor that way. So we'll leave that with you.